DOA from 1949 was a very entertaining crime noir film with a very entertaining premise. So the film opens up as this sickish Frank Bigelow character. He's played by Edmund O'Brien, arrives at a police station. And there's actually this very neat opening sequence as the camera just tracks Frank, making his way through the station as he goes to report a murder. His murder. <laughs> Pretty cool crime noir stuff already. Where was this murder committed? San Francisco, last night. Who was murdered? I was. So we go from this police station into a flashback to see Frank in the past at his office. Now he's an accountant and he's decided to take one week of vacation in San Francisco. Now his girlfriend Paula, played here by Pamela Britton from My Favorite Martian, is upset that he's leaving, but he talks to her and they decide to go get a drink at Eddie's place before he leaves. Now she's very emotional and wants to go with him too, but she doesn't want to crowd him, so she lets him go. And soon enough, he's on his way and he arrives at a San Francisco hotel and checks in. And while he's there, he's also checking out a lot of the girls who are walking by. So yeah, maybe Frank's sort of a scumball to his faithful girlfriend Paula, but well, you know, it's a crime noir film going on here, not romance. Anyhow, the guy at the desk gives him a pamphlet on how to have fun in San Francisco. Yeah, but things were a wee bit different 70 years ago. So he goes to his room and here's this weird thing at this point. Whenever he looks at a woman go past, there's this weird slide whistle noise. I go. Say, is it always like this around here? Now I thought going into this, maybe I had a bogus copy of this film since it is in the public domain and there are a lot of dodgy copies out there. But this was the one I watched on Amazon Prime with that weird slide whistle noise. It's like something you'd hear in a Marx Brothers film. Thank you. Anyhow, whatever. In his room, with the door open, he calls his girl Paula back home, meanwhile watching the women outside of his room. Uh, yeah, anyhow, after the call, Sam, a guest across the hall from him, invites him over to a party at a suite. He goes over, have some drinks with them, and meets some of the other people. And the ladies all there want to go out and party, so they head to a club. And they find one with some happening jazz going on. Frank leaves the business people and goes to flirt with a lone woman at the bar, but he forgot his drink though, and when he asks the bartender, we see a mysterious figure quickly switch the drink before it's brought over to him. Hmm. Well, Frank heads back to his room and then the next day wakes up and doesn't feel so good. He goes to a doctor and the preliminary test comes back clean, but after they check the labs, they determine he's been made sick with a mysterious incurable poison. So he freaks out and runs off and gets a second opinion, you know, like most anybody would do, and then realizes, yeah, from this other doctor, he's been poisoned, and he's going to die soon, with potentially just a few days to go. So of course he freaks out about it, but eventually kind of gets back to his senses and determines that he's going to investigate to find out who murdered him. Ah, great premise for a crime film, I love it. And I have to say, one of the things I really love about this old film is the location footage. There are long series of tracking shots throughout the film, you know, like when he's running through San Francisco. It's just one of those things I really like. It's like that window into the past. It's funny too, reading about that scene where Frank is on the run, is this was considered a stolen shot where people along the sidewalk, they had no idea that a movie was being filmed. And, you know, no idea why there's Edmund O'Brien just running through them all. You know, that's awesome. I love that little window of the past and you know, there's people from 70 years ago, they have no idea what's going on and <laughs> what, what's Edmund O'Brien doing here running through us? Anyhow, Frank King continues with his investigating. He tracks back and returns to the bar and then he calls Paula back home and she provides a clue about businessman Eugene Phillips who had been urgently trying to contact Frank by phone when suddenly he had died. So Frank, just kind of on a hunch, travels to Los Angeles to go to 
the business run by this Phillips character encounters some shady characters. He's asking a lot of questions. And, you know, honestly, I'm not going to try to explain it all because I found it a little bit confusing and probably my job explaining it is going to be just as confusing. But I'll say this. He goes through a series of investigations and eventually he's apprehended by some criminal thugs including this one thug, Chester, who's played by Neville Brand. He's a real jerk of a bad guy. I think he was in Stalag 17 as well with uh, William Holden. Anyhow, Frank is brought before the crime lord, Mr. Majak, played by Luther Adler. And this is the guy, he's been involved in purchasing some of this illegal iridium stuff that may have been involved in his poisoning. Since Frank has learned too much, apparently he needs to be killed. And this crime lord sends Chester to take Frank out of the city and put him to death. And this Chester guy, man, he's really looking forward to it because he's crazy. He tried to make a boob out of me in front of Major. Shouldn't have done that, Bigelow. I don't like that. I'm going to enjoy this, Bigelow. i done jobs like this before. I knocked off guys I could like. I don't like you, Bigger. I never liked that puss of yours from the minute I seen it. Yeah. I'm going to enjoy this. But on the drive there, Frank is able to just make a quick run for it. And again, there's more cool vintage location shots, like the old drugstore that he runs through. It's great stuff. A police officer manages to shoot Chester, and Frank is able to run and get away. And soon he has an encounter with Paula, who has showed up in San Francisco. And, you know, there's a little bit of the sappiness, but it's sweet. You know, I love you, Paula, more than I thought it possible to love anyone in the world kind of stuff. You know, <laughs> I love it. And with just a little time left, Frank continues his investigating. But will he be able to find the true killer in time? Well, I think this film comes to a great conclusion. I don't want to spoil too much more. So if you're in the mood for a great gritty crime noir classic. Go check this one out. Now, just some quick closing thoughts. I think Edmund O'Brien is a fantastic actor. He has been in several films I've watched and reviewed on this channel, like White Heat, Up Periscope, The Hitchhiker, and so on. I like that he's an actor that just has this likable realism. He doesn't really look like, you know, an Errol Flynn-style Hollywood icon, but he looks just more like a regular guy, and I like that. He's relatable to the viewer. Now, I will bring up one little nitpick, is the fact that his character was an accountant, but yet he sort of morphs into this private investigator detective. Okay, that was a little, maybe a little hokey. If they had introduced his character as a private investigator who had been poisoned, that might have made a little more sense, but yeah, whatever, just go with it, it's all fun. Pamela Britton was excellent as Frank's long-suffering girlfriend, Paula. And also liked Neville Brand as that notably creepy thug Chester. That guy was a creep. Dimitri Tiomkin provided the score, so you know the music is great for this one. And I believe the film is in the public domain from what I've read, so you can find it all over the place. If you have Amazon Prime, there's a pretty decent version there. But what's with that goofy movie cover? It reminds me of Mystery Science Theater. <laughs> Anyhow, that's Dead on Arrival, or DOA, from 1949, starring Edmund O'Brien. It's a great crime noir classic worth checking out.